a couple of my students who had really struggled in class actually did much better online for like various reasons. Some of them just had trouble being in school and the social aspects of it. But I felt everything was able to be more individualized and personalized. And I was able to divide my class into more groups too, because we weren't in the physical space. Yeah. In just, this mentoring moment episode, them, we like speak with Marty Geltman, a sixth grade yeah. math and science teacher from Queens, New York. Marty shares how transitioning from an active, hands on, face to face learning environment to a completely online model is killing. Mm. Sure it is. Together, we brainstorm how to deal with dead air fear on Zoom, how to get your students to take risks, and how to engage students while teaching strictly online. This, my friends, is another Math Mentoring Moment episode where we talk with a member of the Math Moment Maker community who's working through struggles and together we brainstorm possible next steps and strategies to overcome them. All right. Let's do this. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce from tapintoteenminds.com. And I'm John Orr from MrOrIsAGeek.com. We are two math teachers who, together... With you, the community of math moment makers worldwide who want to build and deliver math lessons that spark curiosity, fuel sense-making, and ignite your teacher moves. Welcome, math moment makers, to another episode here with a fun, fun friend from the math moment maker community. Let's get ready for this jam-packed episode while we chat about online learning and transitioning to online learning. But uh, before we do, let's say thank you to all of you math moment makers out there around the world, especially you who have taken the time to share feedback by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. This week, we want to highlight Tara, who gave us a five-star rating and review that said the best math podcast. Oh my gosh, that just fills our hearts. Kyle and John really know their stuff. I have learned and continue to learn so much from them. They have truly helped me to become a better math educator. Keep up the great work, guys. Wow. We can't thank Tara enough for that one. It's humbling to see that kind of stuff, right, Kyle? But we want to thank Tara also for uh, taking time out of her day to uh, not only listen, but also help us grow the podcast by leaving the review and the rating on Apple Podcasts. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tara, thank you so much uh, to you listening at home right now. If you haven't taken a moment, go ahead and pause to leave us an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, because you know what? It would definitely fill our hearts. But that's not it. Right, John? There's more to it. Not just our hearts that can be full right now. Yes, because Tara's heart could be full because she actually is now entered into our draw, our rating and review contest, because she shared her review, a screenshot of that review on social media. And you can, too, share your review on social media uh, to enter our contest to win one of five copies from Peter Lillidal's new book, Building Thinking Classrooms in Mathematics K-12. through Kyle, tell them how they can enter and win. Yes. Uh, you know what? The details pretty simple, pretty simple. First one is you're going to head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. If you're on a different platform that has a rating and review system, go for it. Uh, figure out how to, how to leave that rating rating and review and uh, you can participate too. Step two, take a screenshot of that review and share it on Twitter or Instagram mentioning at make math moments or in our free private Facebook group, share that screenshot in that group, which is called math moment makers K through 12. And then finally, step three on the same post, uh, just do us a favor. It'll make finding your review easier if you hashtag it with hashtag MMM giveaway, like make math moments giveaway, MMM giveaway. And that's it. That was it. Just three easy steps and you are in. Right now we've got a handful of ratings and reviews in and their chances of winning 
I would say is pretty high. We're giving away five books, so uh, that's going to be a great win on your end. I know that so many folks are enjoying that book. I'm seeing a lot of social media. I know Kyle's got that book in his district. We have that book in our district. It's being spread around school to schools. So we're giving away five copies of that book, right, Kyle? Absolutely. So five copies, uh, but make sure in order to get in on this rating and review giveaway, you'll need to get your rating and review in for this particular contest by December 31st, 2020. And if you're listening after December 31st, 2020, go ahead and do the same process as above because uh, we'll be running another giveaway quite soon. Awesome. Now let's dive in to our discussion here with Marty. Hey there, Marnie. Thanks for joining us here on the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing pretty well. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Marty, tell us a little bit about yourself for Kyle and I and also our listeners. Like, where are you coming from? How long have you been teaching? What's that teaching journey look like for you? Fill us in on a little bit of your backstory here. Sure. So I am coming from New York City, the borough of Queens, and I have been a public school teacher in the New York City Department of Education for 13 years. So I taught first in the Bronx, and then for the last five years, I've been in Queens, really close to where I live. So it's been great. The past four years, when I moved to Queens, I got the chance to be able to teach just math and science, which had been my goal for a while. This year, with everything happening with New York City Public Schools, I was moved from fifth grade math and science to sixth grade teaching everything. So a little bit different this year, but the great thing about it is I looped up with a bunch of my students from last year, which is always something I had wanted to do. So I have a lot of the same students that I was working with last year. Awesome, awesome stuff. I know for me, teaching math is something I love. It would probably be a good struggle for me to have to get thrown into a different subject area just to remember what that feels like to start from scratch all over again. Very interesting. I'm wondering now, what does it look like in your context, in your borough of Queens for your classroom structure? Are you in a hybrid model? Are you fully online? Are you face to face? Give us a little bit of that backstory. Right. So New York City Public Schools did open for in-person. I, within my school, am a remote teacher. So I'm the all remote sixth grade teacher. A lot of teachers in the building are doing what's called a blended or hybrid model. So they have students in person, but we don't have enough capacity for the students to come every day. So students are coming once every three days, we have three cohorts, and then the other two days they're learning from home. So I'm teaching from an empty classroom in my building to a computer, but the rooms next door to me have students in them. So it's a really strange year, honestly. There are so many less kids in the building than usual. Yeah. In our school, when we walk down the halls, our kids are in classrooms, but not to be in the hallways. We don't even switch between periods anymore. We're just all in one room. And it seems weird when the bell rings. Normally halls fill with students and it's like very congested, but now it's like empty. It's like a ghost town. I totally uh, echo that. I'm wondering, Marnie, one of the questions we ask everybody on the podcast is if we think back to your experiences in your education and think about math class, and we say the word math class, what comes to mind? What's a moment that you remember or sticks out to you for some reason? Could you share that with us? And why does it stick out for you? Yeah, I mean, when I think about math class, it was something I was always good at when I was really little, like elementary school. I liked it. Fifth grade really pops into my mind because we studied decimals and I was really good at decimals. I lived in Maryland. I didn't live in New York. They sent me to like a championship for decimals and you know, I competed against all these other kids in the same county. So when I was that young, it was something that I thought that I was really good at and I really liked, but that changed as I got older. So 
Interesting. Interesting. I'm wondering, how do you feel that moment or those moments may have influenced how you teach? Like, do you look back to those times and do you try to think of like why you felt you were good at math or maybe the influence that maybe your parents or your home life or your teachers may have had on you? How might that influence how things are sort of going in your classroom now? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, again, when I was young, like fifth and sixth grade, my teachers encouraged me, I thought that I was good at math, as I got the older up into algebra and like high school, it became a lot more difficult. I didn't like math as much. And then when I went away to college, I chose a school where I knew I wouldn't have to take any math class because I just wanted to avoid it. That's how terrible my high school experience was. But I think because I wasn't as good at upper level math, like high school math, as some other math teachers in my school, I think that it helps me be able to see from, you know, I work with a lot of kids who have special needs and IEPs. And I think it helps me to see things from like their vantage point that math isn't always easy. When I was growing up, it was taught by a lot of rules and procedures. And it's not easy for all kids to memorize a bunch of rules and procedures. It's also not very much fun. When I think back now, I always liked math, but I guess it wasn't very much fun. It was just easy for me to do. The way that I try to teach math now is for students to make sense of it, that math should make sense. It shouldn't just be a bunch of things that you memorize. Yeah, for sure. And that's something that we definitely share resources and ideas here on the podcast about. I'm wondering, though, Marnie, this transition you had, you went from decimal queen doing so well that it influenced your memory to being like, oh, I want to not take math ever again. And I actually choose my university so that I don't take math class. Like fill us in on that. Like what happened during that transition? How do we go from like, we're loving it, but then uh, ooh, hating it. Was it that you just felt like it was all procedures and memorizing or where did the wheels fall off there? Yeah, I mean, I remember it being okay through middle school, not liking it as much, but I still did well and could understand. And I think geometry was fine, too. It was like trigonometry, I think, where it really started to not make sense to me and to not really be much fun. And I don't know, I was, I know pre-calculus was where it really, really went way far downhill. I still did okay in like trigonometry, but pre-calculus, I just remember doing really poorly on the tests and not understanding the way that my teacher was explaining things. And she would sit with me after I'd taken the test and try to explain to me. And I remember saying, yeah, that then I understood, but of course it wasn't doing me a lot of good at that point. So yeah, all my memories of math class from pre-calculus would have been my junior year, just sitting there feeling like I didn't understand a thing that she was saying. None of it made sense to me. This is such a common experience and it's not always so dramatic, but it does happen where the wheels and John already sort of said it. We use that term quite often on the show talking about the wheels falling off. And I've always said that if we are teaching procedures first and oftentimes it's mostly memorization of procedures, for some students, and I was that student, the wheels didn't fall off for me in grade 10 or 11 or in pre-calculus or calculus. It was once I was in university. And it's almost like everyone gets to the point where your brain can only handle so many steps without a connection, right? It's like phone numbers, it's seven digits long. A lot of people can handle seven. Some people struggle handling seven digits. They're all disconnected. They're all unrelated. If we had 13 digit phone numbers, that might be really difficult for some people, but some people might still be able to do it. And I find math class when taught that way can often be like that. And it's really hard when we've been praised for being so good or being able to do those procedures so well or recall those procedures that we're convinced that that's what math is. And that can really cause us some struggles later. So thanks for uh, opening up to us and being vulnerable with us. Let's get to some positivity here. I'm wondering, what is a recent win that you can share with us from your math teaching? Maybe it's recently as today or this week, or maybe it's something from this school year that pops into your mind as a teaching success you can share. Yeah, I mean, I think as recently as maybe the spring with remote learning, 
although I feel differently about it this year, but in the spring, schools were shut down in March. We spent time just taking attendance and trying to find students, but then we really got back to the teaching. And I had two different math classes, math and science classes I was teaching. What I liked about remote teaching was that I really found that online, it could be a little bit more personalized. I found that this wasn't true of all students, but it allowed some of my students who really wanted to go on to excel. And a couple of my students who had really struggled in class actually did much better online for like various reasons. Some of them just had trouble being in school and the social aspects of it. But I felt everything was able to be more individualized and personalized. And I was able to divide my class into more groups too, because we weren't in the physical space. Yeah. And just being able to do activities with them. Like I use the Jamboard a lot. I don't know if people are familiar with the Jamboard to do sense making activities. And they were able to having groups of students all writing on the board at the same time, then coming back together to like talk about their thinking. Those are some great wins. I'm really glad that you brought up like the silver linings of teaching online and making the best of teaching through a crisis. And we've been talking with a lot of teachers about that over the last, say, six months in the academy and also on the podcast. But everyone seems to be finding silver linings like yours, where, you know, we've heard teachers say that you're giving kids voices that normally wouldn't have voices. They're finding that they're getting more engagement versus you didn't see that engagement with kids when they're in class, but now that they're doing so much more online, we're hearing all sorts of things with teachers like you who are doing little groupings. My kids' own teachers, they did some groupings like that where my kids would log on and they would be in these small groups on their virtual classroom or their Meet, their Google Meet, and doing some pretty cool activities. So I'm glad you shared that kind of silver lining. I think it's sometimes easy to remember that this is chaos and a tough situation because it's not the normal. And I feel like it's almost going to be the new normal, which is sad, but it could be. I'm super glad that you shared that win. I'm wondering, Marty, what else is on your mind right now? Like, what can we brainstorm about today? What's a struggle or a challenge that you're experiencing that you want to just share with us now and then we can hash it out together? So I'm finding remote teaching a lot more challenging now. I mean, as I said, I'm with the same kids, but first of all, it's a sixth grade curriculum, which I have not taught before. I think the curriculum that we use is not a very good curriculum, especially for students who are, I have English language learners. And which is it? Huh? It's Go Math. And I mean, anything can be adapted, but New York City actually stopped using that curriculum a couple of years ago and went to Envisions, which I also don't think is much better. But things can be adapted. I think a lot of the problems in it are really too wordy and aren't really about teaching the math. The way some things are worded are just really tricky in terms of it feels like they're just trying to trick kids, not actually teach them something. But I tend to throw those out, those problems like that. But yeah, I think remote teaching is a lot more harder with a group of kids you don't totally know. I use breakout rooms a lot in the spring, but now I'm putting them in breakout rooms and going around and none of them are talking or they're talking and they're stopping when I go into the breakout room. I'm really not sure. Yeah. And also finding because the time I have is a lot less. We had a double math block in school, which I know a lot of people don't, but I could do the direct lesson and problem solving and games and all sorts of things you can fit into like a hundred minutes. And, you know, a lot of the things I like to do, like playing games, is harder remotely. And, you know, when I use the Jamboard, it does seem to go pretty well. They all like write it up. But I worry about, you know, I have a class of 33, like that it's hard to monitor if all the kids are really participating and who's really understanding and, you know, if everybody's really getting as much out of it. So... Yeah, it's definitely been a challenge. Yeah, interesting. It sounds like a lot of common themes that we hear a lot about some of the struggles of teaching online. I'm wondering, can you tell us more? Let's dive deeper here. It sounds like you have some challenges. And I guess what we're hoping to do is get to maybe some of the root of the problem. So if we think of some of the challenges you've shared so far, you had mentioned about kids maybe not 
interacting or talking, that discourse doesn't seem to maybe be the same as it was in a face-to-face. Sounds like time is a bit of an issue. Some of the things are more difficult remotely. What's that holding you back from getting at? And I guess what else can you share with us here so that we can dive deeper and try to maybe take a little bite, as they say, take a bite out of that big elephant? What do you do to eat an elephant? You take one bite at a time. So let's keep digging here. Sure. I mean, I think one thing, I mean, there are various ways to communicate online besides kids just talking. So we use Zoom and they can type into the chat. And so some part of it is technical issues. Not every kid in New York City has a device. Most of my students do. But then some of them will have cameras not working or microphones not working. But that's, of course, not something I can do from my end. So I like to give kids the option if they don't want to unmute and talk that they can type into the chat. At the point, though, on Zoom, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Zoom, that you're sharing your screen and having the kids talk and type into the chat. It is at one time kind of like a lot to manage. That's why I like to have them write on the Jamboard because then I can just kind of look at the Jamboard and see what they're doing. I mean, I can see from the icons who's doing what, but then it tends to be one student really kind of dominating and a lot of the others will stand back. So I'm trying to think about more ways to get more of them to participate instead of the same students all the time. I have tried assigning them different jobs in the breakout room. But again, I like to give them a little bit of choice and they all seem to always want to do the same job all the time. It's the same person who writes on the jam board. It's the same person who is going to share back with the whole class. So I guess I'm trying to think of ways to get them to be willing to take some risks or take on something that they might not be so comfortable with. Gotcha. So I was just about to ask a question that tried to kind of narrow down where you felt like the real struggle for you is or how we can help you. But I think maybe you just said that you said, I'm trying to get them to take some risks. You're trying to get more engagement. Does that kind of sum up some of the struggle that you're having right now? Like you're wanting some more engagement. Maybe it's compared to your live in class, face to face classroom, but you're not getting that the way you want to online. Does that kind of sum up or help me understand how we can help you here? Yeah, no, I think that's it. Engagement can be measured in different ways, but with a limited time. And yeah, I just like to know that more of them are engaging and understanding what we're doing. And I'm wondering so that we can do a little bit of a compare and contrast for thinking about maybe some of this risk taking. Can you paint us a little bit of a picture? And I've got some, I guess, a hypothesis of some of the things maybe that you might do in a face to face environment. But just so that we're a little more clear and we're not making assumptions on this end, what might a lesson look like or sound like if you were face to face with your students? And maybe we can try to figure out how do we try to help not necessarily mirror, I know it's going to be different, but to be able to try to pull at some of the things that maybe some of your students in your face-to-face class were able to do, or maybe this might have been a struggle there as well, but I'm going to argue that any struggle face-to-face is probably going to be increased online. So let's get a better sense of what that might look like face-to-face if we were able to be in that environment. Sure. Well, yeah, face to face, we every day it's with some type of a warm up. It was usually different. I would do something like which one doesn't belong or sometimes a number string or something with estimating to get them interested. Something that was usually somewhat quick it would be built up from the beginning of the year. So they all knew kind of the procedures, but always like giving them individual think time and then chances to share out. And then after that, we would go into the lesson. Depending on what I'm teaching, it's different on different days. Sometimes it does start with more direct instruction. More often than not, recently, I give them a problem or something to work on, either with partners or in trios. And I really have them work it out and try to figure out their own answer and what they think about it before I tell them anything. I would drive my fifth graders crazy because they'd be like, Ms. Geltman, just give us the answer. Tell us if we're right. And I'm like, no, you can develop strategies. You guys can check your own work. You have to figure out if you're right. And that would always drive them crazy in like September and October. And then we just got used to it. And then have the students present basically 
you know, it's the, I'm going to blank on this, but it's the New York City has the algebra for all. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but the process of like then selecting which problems to have them present in a certain order so that they can kind of get to the point of the lessons themselves. So, oh, okay. That sounds kind of like five practices. Yeah. Maybe like a variation. Five oh, okay. So, I'm just going to do a quick recap, but I'm going to ask another question to go a little bit deeper. Like you are starting off with some kind of warm up that juices flowing, gets kids talking. You've got some estimations or which one doesn't belong, or you've got a number string happening. And then when you said you go into a lesson, you said it's more direct instruction or it's a problem that kids and partners or trios would work on. I'm wondering what that lesson or that problem looks like for you, like a typical problem. Like, is that just here's a word problem, go ahead and solve it? Or how does that set up for you? I'm trying to gauge like what that interaction and engagement looks like face to face so that when we try to move this online, how can we give you some tips to make it a little bit more engaging? What's it look like face to face, like that problem, general problem? Is it just, hey, here's the word problem, guys, go ahead, work it out. Let's talk about strategies after. Or is there something more to that? Yeah, I mean, it's not just a word problem from the book. I try and pick tasks that are high floor, low ceiling, that have multiple entry points. I mean, to give you an example from fifth grade last year, one of the units we do is volume. So to start it off, and this actually takes place over two days, but we give the kids unifix cubes and each partnership gets 24 unifix cubes and ask them to build as many rectangular prisms as they can. And then they chart the different prisms that they can, uh, the different rectangular prisms they can build. And usually it, it goes into a debate about whether if the box is faced a different way, it's actually a different rectangular prism. So yeah, then everyone charts it and we share out and talk about the different connections between, I'm going to blank on this too. But um, the idea is like something that is like hands on that has multiple entry points that allow kids in the different ways that they learn to be able to access basically the content of the lesson. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So it sounds to me like a pretty standard problem based lesson. I don't mean standard by like not effective. I think that would be a great way to get students engaged. And I'm picturing in my mind that there's a context here. It's a challenge. You're giving students this sort of opportunity for them to try to argue it out. I might even maybe throw in an estimate in there. Like how many different do you think you could do? Like, is it like two or is it like 20, you know, and getting them talking and all those things. I love this idea of a debate in there. Now, I'm wondering if you were to teach a similar lesson and now you're in this online world, would that picture you'd painted a second ago, would it be a similar picture or how does that picture change currently given the restraints and the, I guess, restrictions of online learning? Yeah, I mean, I think it changes because the kids don't really have manipulatives at home. I have looked into like online things, but in the case of volume in particular, it's hard to find things that actually work. Online, you can get manipulatives like the Cuisinaire rods and things like that that are really good for fractions. But yeah, I guess I just feel like it's hard to, because the kids are not all physically together, it's hard to kind of replicate that same experience. I mean, certainly I could give them the same type of problem, but I guess it's hard to visualize how they can work it out as well when they don't have the tools that they would have in a regular classroom. That's true. So the lack of manipulatives can be restricting in the sense of which activities you can do, which activities you're not going to be able to do, or how do you find a substitute? And is it a valid substitute? Like even if we do find virtual manipulatives, are those manipulatives easy to use? One, easy to access Two, and then does it simplify the activity? Does it take away from the activity or does it add to it or does it just make it harder? And I think it depends on the activity in those cases. So the case for this particular activity, I think you can still do some interesting things online, but let's kind of go back to the start of, say, this activity. Let's paint it picture for the online start of your class, go through kind of end of your class. What does that look like now so that we can all of a sudden can inject some tips in there to bring back the life that you had in your face to face? Yeah. So again, I'm teaching sixth grade math, which I'm less comfortable with. I'm finding the first unit anyway in our curriculum 
is a lot of review from fifth grade. I mean, I have about half an hour to 45 minutes now. I usually start with an online game. There are a lot of for fluency, basically. I try to use a couple of different websites for fluency and none of them are working well. So I start with a game that's like multiplication fluency since the unit we're in right now is a lot of multiplying and dividing and prime factorization and all that. Because again, I think it gets them engaged. They really like the games. Basically, I demonstrate the game for them. You know, I find with the fifth and sixth graders, they're not so great at reading through directions. So we don't necessarily play the game during the 30 to 45 minutes, but I will more often than not demonstrate a game for them, maybe let one of them try it. And that takes about the first, I just try to keep it to like five to eight minutes. And then after that, we usually go into the lesson. I mean, where I teach, you have to have the learning target up, that sort of thing. So again, I use the jam board. What I do instead of doing a bunch of problems, I mean, now I have been doing a lot of direct instruction. The first unit's basically dividing large decimal numbers, multiplying large decimal numbers, dividing like decimals by whole numbers. But what I do is like slow down and focus on the sense making of it. I always have them estimate first. So at the end with the decimals, they're placing the decimal point by estimation instead of doing like the routine of like counting. And I have the students talk through it. So those that can unmute and ask them to explain their thinking. And I usually keep going even when they make a mistake or say a wrong answer and then ask all the kids to look at it and give them feedback about it. I only have time to do about three problems. So I choose the problem strategically so that I know if they're going to encounter all the mistakes they might make. Like with dividing, a lot of time it's placing the zero. And then with the decimal numbers, it's dividing like a decimal number by a whole number and ending up with a really small decimal. So yeah, I try and include all the different problem types that they are going to encounter in the lesson, basically. And then put them into breakout rooms to work on it together. And then we come back in the whole class and kind of share out their ideas and their solutions. I think Kyle is going to talk, but he's on mute. Sorry, I was on mute. (laughs) 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 I was chatting away all by myself. (laughs) Uh, So thank you so much for uh, painting a clear picture because I'm totally feeling you. I've had a lot of conversations, not only with John and with some of the math moment makers in our Q&A sessions, but also many educators in my district that I feel like when we got thrown in the online world, it's almost like we get knocked down a few pegs from our expertise, right? So you sort of painted this picture in the face-to-face environment where you're starting more with problems. You still said you had some direct instruction sort of lessons, and those still happen here in there. And I know that we're all working to try to make problem-based lessons as often as possible. But then we get to online learning and it's almost like we get this distraction where we're so over-focusing on the technology and how are students going to connect and is the internet connection going to be okay? Is everyone's mic working and all of these distractions going on that we tend to resort back to what we're most familiar with. And I think for most of us, most of us coming from an experience where we were probably in a math class where there was a lesson and the teacher was there trying to give some examples and trying to almost anticipate the different struggles that we might have. These are all really common things. And When I think back to working with decimals, actually, we just did a workshop for some educators in my school district recently about working with decimal tenths and starting to operate with decimal tenths. And something I might mention here that might be worth maybe thinking about as you're planning these lessons and trying to think of how you might deliver them online is kind of thinking about backward design. And my colleague, uh, Yvette Lehman, sort of got this on my radar because it's how John and I have been doing things for a long time, but we didn't really have like a name to put on it. But backwards design is all about trying to figure out what are your desired results? So like, what do I want students to know, understand and do? And then we start thinking about like, what's the evidence that students are going to show me. So through observations, conversations, and product. And then finally, 
From there, once we've identified those two things, we can start thinking about planning the learning experiences. And part of this process for me is trying to think of like, what are all the things that kids are going to have to do before they are able to tackle this new idea? So if it's dividing decimals, for example, if I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is pretty procedural. I'm now trying to think of how do I backwards map this to figure out what do students need to be able to do before we get to this place? And then I want to think of the experience I want to give them. And when I say experience, like to us, that's like that problem-based sort of approach. Like what question could I ask them and give them that opportunity to wrestle with it. And something I heard earlier, you had mentioned early in the conversation was about this worry or concern that you had that like, what if students aren't actually engaging, right? Or it's hard to tell if they're engaged in the lesson because they are at home. And I think when that happens, when we have that thought in our mind, we immediately start to think about, okay, well, I'm going to do more talking so that there's no dead air. And in that online environment, there is a lot of that. And we have to almost put that to the side and say, you know what, there's probably going to be a couple kids that may not engage. Maybe it's their home environment. Maybe it's something else. But if I can think of that provocation, that opportunity for them to actually wrestle with a problem and then come back and be able to share that out, it might save us from having to do a lot of that talking up front. So I'm going to pause there. I know we mentioned a lot there, but I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on that? Are there any takeaways there or anything that we could go deeper in, really try to help you with moving forward here? Yeah, well, I think first of all, yeah, the dead air on Zoom is like, because I had developed to be really good in the classroom of wait time, but I don't know why it feels so much longer online. Any dead air is like... Uh, it's so new to us. People. It's so scary, right? Yeah, it's very scary. And the funny thing is sometimes I mute all their microphones because sixth graders will all start yelling over each other. The five of them are talking. And then I forget I muted all of them and they can't unmute and Zoom and they're like, waving their hands at me. And I'm like, what are you guys talking about? I did that today, actually. I was just going to um, add one thing I did one time. I could, I'm back in the classroom face to face now. But when we were online, one thing to fill dead air was to play music really low. It's like background music, like an elevator or something. It's like, just have the music, which you can just queue up on your computer. It'll play in the Zoom and when you share your screen. And so you could play it real low. And it's like, it takes that like silence out. And then- Is it the edge? Is it yeah, an edge? Yeah, it just takes the edge <laughs> out. And then kids can still wave when they want to talk. And then you can mute the music or bring it down. And it relieves a little bit of that weirdness, you know? And Because in the classroom, you're used to that weirdness. Or there's like, you can hear the, the murmurs of them like discussing or thinking and, and talking. But, but it, you know, online, you don't get that. Like you said, that dead air, it's kind of, it feels awful. You got to feel it. But maybe just playing a little bit of music lightly can just take that pressure off of you so that you don't have to fill it. Something's filling it and you're waiting for them to do some thinking. And, and I think one of the tips we got from Peter Lilladal is that he would give them a problem and they would all just wait for him to solve it. He used to do it like that. And then he explained to us, and this is from episode 21 of the podcast, he explained that he just walk out of this classroom and then say like, I'll be back in 10 minutes. I got to go photocopy something. And then when he comes back, he's like, what, did you guys not talk about this or solve this? I got to go back and photocopy something. And he did that for like a day until it clicked into his students that they were going to have to be the ones that do the thinking. He wasn't going to be the one. And so it's like sometimes I had to find myself doing that a little bit when I first went online. It was like, I'm not going to talk here, guys. I'm going to wait for you guys to kind of give me something either in the chat or give me something in the live session or one of the two. And so I think it might take getting used to, but I think you know, almost like setting those routines, setting those standards of this is what our class is going to look like might help. Yeah, I think you're right. I was also just thinking as you were talking to that um, something that might help is giving them problems ahead of time so that they can have the individual think time when we're not actually in class. That way I'm using my time in class more wisely. That's actually a really cool idea as well. 
I love how even through this discussion, you know, just different ideas. And this is something I find with every conversation I have with an educator is, you know, it just makes me think a little differently about how things could go. When I'm on my own, you go through the motions. It's really hard sometimes to notice and name some of the feelings you have and some of the things that are happening because you have so much going on. When we just talk it out, I feel like a lot of these new perspectives sort of come in. And Something else, too, that I'm now hyper aware of since doing a lot of PD online, for example, like John and I, we've traveled around the world really doing different PD sessions, conferences, full day workshops, sometimes multi day workshops. And we've loved the experience doing all of those things. And they're to us anyway, there's nothing like doing it face to face. And we tend to find ways to engage the crowd. But Going online and doing it online so much lately has really made me realize I've become this hyper aware of how important it is to have a good question. And what I realized is that if I don't craft my question precisely enough, and not saying that the question has to be the perfect question, but the way we frame the question can really impact someone's motivation to want to engage with it. And I see this because I'm now doing PD with adults where I think as educators, we are the first ones to want to opt out of participating when we're in a PD, right? You know, you're tired. Sometimes we're a little more concerned about maybe what our colleagues think. We don't want to be looked as maybe the keener or whatever it might be. It's easier to opt out and turn anonymous online. So I think this experience, while it's hard, we're feeling for you. I know there's a lot of people that are listening who are going through similar struggles, and I'm going through these struggles as I try to lead sessions online with educators. I think it's going to make us all better if we reference or if we think about this importance of the question we're going to ask to truly get people, and in this case for you, it's going to be your students, to engage and truly think through the problem and and allow you to do maybe less of that direct instruction. I think the direct instruction piece, it comes out of us when we're uncertain, maybe when we're not confident that, not saying confidence like you don't think anyone's engaging, you're just uncertain if they are. So when we're in uncertainty, we sort of resort back to what we're familiar with and, and what we know will fill some of that dead air, that Zoom dead air we were talking about a little earlier. So I'm really going to challenge you to maybe think about that like before every single lesson. Think of like, what's that question that I'm going to ask that's going to be our provocation and where might we go? And I'm going to reference a few things because I know you're a math moment maker in the academy and we do have a full distance learning course inside that academy with some cheat sheets. And we actually go through some of our math moment units and math moment tasks from the academy. So that might be something like a next step for you to check out and maybe have a look at and see if any of those tips help you along the way as well. But at this point, we're looking at the time and I'm wondering what might be your next step and any takeaways that you might have from the conversation tonight as we try to learn forward as a group here. I mean, yeah, I'll definitely take a look at the things that you suggested I think one thing from the thing you just said, I realized is that is a lot harder now. It is so important to talk to other teachers and other people doing the work. And I think it's much, even though we're all in the building together in New York City, because of social distancing and all of that, no one eats lunch together. We don't have meetings in the same way. So it is, I think we have to be more intentional about having conversations with people because pre-COVID time, I would bring this up at lunch with my colleagues and we'd work it out on the board and kind of figure it out. So I think it's too, it's finding new ways to like engage with other educators who are concerned about moving their practice forward. Awesome. Awesome stuff. So now that we've chatted about a number of different things here in this call, how are you feeling now after this call and say going back to your classroom? I'm definitely feeling a lot more positive. I think there's always something new that I can try. And it's good to just, again, talk to other people who are really thinking about math instruction and having experience, you know, doing with all sorts of groups. So yeah, this definitely has given me feeling a little bit more hopeful than I did at the end of today. Oh, that's so awesome to hear. And like we said earlier, right, that elephant 
Right now, we're all dealing with some form of a modified teaching life right now. And that might be the proverbial elephant. And if we're going to try to eat that elephant, we want to do it one bite at a time. And it sounds like you've picked that first bite to start with, which I think is a great place to begin. I know we just referenced the Academy and the distance learning course. We're going to post some links in the show notes. We also have a distance learning guide that's up on the website that people can grab and grab some cheat sheets from it. If you want to dive deeper into the distance learning course for those who are listening, they can check out and learn how to become a member of the Academy at makemathmoments.com forward slash Academy. But for you, Marnie, I'm wondering, are you open to us maybe checking in with you a little bit down the road to see how things are progressing and see if we can uh, maybe take a second bite or maybe it'll be the 10th bite by then, but to keep eating that big, big elephant. Yeah, sure. That would be great. I'm sure uh, being able to check in and see how things are going or get a perspective uh, would be wonderful. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Marty, we want to thank you so much for joining us here on the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. And uh, we wish you all the best of luck going back into your classroom tomorrow and and all the other days and uh, look forward to chatting with you in the future. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Have a great night. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. As always, both John and I learn so much from these conversations with folks like you from the Math Moment Maker community. But in order to ensure that we hang on to this new learning, we've got to make sure that we do something to reflect so it doesn't wash away like footprints in the sand. For John and I, we write these show notes and we're going through and planning for the episode. So it helps it to stick in our minds. What would be a good way for you to go ahead and do some of that same reflecting there, John? Hmm, yeah, you could write it down. You could share it with someone, uh, so your partner a colleague at work, or with the Math Moment Maker community by commenting on the show notes page, which we'll give you the link a little bit later. You can tag at Make Math Moments on social media or join us in our free private Facebook group, Math Moment Makers K through 12. Awesome stuff. And you know what? While you're at it, if you haven't done your rating and review contest, go ahead and do that now. Take that screenshot, fire it up on social media and tag us up and you'll uh, likely or highly likely walk away with a copy of Peter Lildahl's new book, Building Thinking Classrooms. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Are you interested in uh, joining us for an upcoming Math Mentoring Moment episode just like Marty did on this episode? It's where we chat with you about a class struggle and together we brainstorm how to overcome it. You can apply over at makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor. That's makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor. And we're going to be choosing some people quite soon for another round of interviews. Awesome stuff there, John. Show notes, links, and transcripts downloadable and readable from the web are ready for you at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 108. That's makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 108. Well, Math Moment Makers, until next time, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And a big high five for you.